Okay, dear colleagues, uh, my name is Danny Booser. I'm an uh, implant surgeon. I uh, have been at the University of Bern and now in a private clinic to continue my surgical activities in patients. You see, during the years, in the last 30 years, we have seen the need to develop instruments for our patients. And first of all, uh, when we treat patients with implants, we should be very careful not to traumatize the tissue too much. Also, low trauma surgical techniques are very important. And we approached Hufridi uh, almost 30 years ago to do that uh, development for us or the, with us. And when you look at these two kits, these are uh, the surgical kits to perform GBR procedures. GBR, as you know, uh, 30 plus years now, uh, is done to regenerate peri-implant bone defects, very important for the long-term stability of implants. Uh, when I look at these instruments, let's start from the outside to the inside. So when we do a surgery, we have to retract the cheeks. And for that, I use, uh, we call them in, in German language, window hook. Huh? So this is a cheek retractor, a very fine one, and this is a larger one. I never use actual retractors that go inside the flap because this is traumatizing the flap unnecessarily. A second one, very important, when we have uh, mobilized the flap, we have to keep the flap off. We are using so-called retraction sutures, and this is a retractor, and you attach actually a mattress suture to this retractor, and then the weight of the retractor keeps off the flap. So this is a very elegant way. It saves you a hand, actually, and that's how I love this instrument. I always have two instruments like this on my surgical table. Okay, what else do we need? Then when we elevate the flap, we need a scalpel. So this is a very nice uh, uh, scalpel holder for the blade. You see, rounded, easy grip, uh, very elegantly designed. Then, of course, we need tissue pliers to hold the flap. And for, for the surgery, you need a, a surgical one, so you have sharp edges here, so you can really grab the flap. But often you don't need to grab the flap, then you have an anatomic one, which is uh, much less aggressive here. And the third one is a very long one sometimes uh, for a two by two or something else. When you go deep inside your cavity, then it's good to have a longer one. So these are the tissue pliers. So when we have done the incision of uh, this mucoperiosteal flap, we need tissue elevators. And uh, the finest one, very elegant, is this tissue elevator. Huh? This, you see, very fine end. And I, I go often uh, in, uh, when we do releasing incisions to mobilize the marginal mucosa very carefully. I can switch it over, then it's a larger one, this one. And then when we go and mobilize the flap itself, then we use this uh, tissue elevator, which is called actually the Boozer elevator. We established in 92. And then we, we mobilize the flap very carefully underneath the periosteum. When the flap is mobilized, and sometimes during a surgery you have to hold the flap away or protect the flap, then this is the third elevator. It's more a protective instrument because a rounded end and a paddle type end you see here. So these are the three tissue elevators we use in every surgery with an open flap procedure. When the flap is open, then often uh, you have then uh, in the bone, you have defects with granulation tissue you have to clean out. Uh, I do that often with, a, with, of course, with the drill. Then I take an, uh, a diamond drill and to smoothen that, but sometimes you have to use uh, these instruments. This is like a cold, we call it an uh, excavator. This is actually from uh, operative dentistry originally. Uh, so uh, this is like a very small curette. Uh, so we can go into small defects and, and get everything out. And you see it's in both ends, once on, to the right side, once to the left side. When the bone is uh, larger, then the defect is larger, then this is a surgical curette. Again, with both ends. See, beautiful when you have sockets as a following extraction and there is granulation tissue, you have to clean it out very carefully. This is the instrument to do that. 
We learned, of course, uh, then to perform a bone augmentation procedure, we need uh, uh, augmentation material. Hmm? And uh, we learned in the mid-90s, based on multiple animal studies, that one single bone filler cannot do the job. So we are always using two bone fillers in combination. And we learned from multiple studies that uh, uh, to speed up the bone healing, you need an osteogenic bone filler, which is actually autologous bone from the same patient. And uh, in the mid-90s, we did a lot of block grafts for that, rich augmentation procedure. And for that, uh, we uh, asked to have chisels, uh, straight chisel, and also rounded chisel. The rounded one is for larger uh, chips. And for the chisel, sometimes you need a mallet to, uh, to loosen the, the block, and then that's the mallet we are using. But I can tell you that uh, in the mid-90s, we did, we did a lot of uh, block augmentation procedures and uh, about 40% of all GBR. And uh, now, uh, these days, this is less than 5% uh, because we have learned so much in post-extraction bone alterations that we learned that when we pull a tooth, we have to act and put an implant in rather early either immediate or after two or four, four months or after six months. And when we do that, then we don't need a block graft. By not using a block graft, you will facilitate a much easier patient's morbidity because you can do a simultaneous bone augmentation procedure. And to do then these, the bone chips, this is done with a chip. And for that, we asked about 20 years ago, Hufridi, to produce for us uh, these bone scrapers. They're called Busa bone scrapers, and why do I like them, you see? I used at that time uh, one of these disposable uh, uh, chisel, uh, these scrapers, you see? And actually, today, in the, in the days that we try to protect the climate and we don't want to produce too much of uh, garbage, you see, I said already 20 years ago, so that cannot be the case. In Perio, we have instruments we can reuse eh, because we have to sharpen them. So I said, please provide for us, or produce for us a bone uh, uh, scraper that can be reused. Uh, I have some of these scrapers 15 years now, and uh, this is, of course, very cost efficient. I will show you how to sharpen them because that is a very important aspect. So we have this scraper in multiple shapes. You see, this one is the, the smallest one, about three millimeters only. Eh? This one is probably the largest one. We have five millimeters. This one is four millimeters. Two ends. Uh, you just decide which one do you need most often. This is one with five millimeters and with three millimeters. So resharpening is very important. For that, you need a stone. Uh, so that's the stone I like the most. It has two colors. So this side is a very fine grit, uh, and this is much a little bit rougher. Uh, I will show you later on uh, in a separate video how we do that. Uh, very important. Uh, it's not difficult. I do it myself. I do it sometimes just after surgery, clean them, do the resharpening, and they go into sterilization again. So, what else do we have? Yes, of course, when the flap uh, is closed, we need uh, the suturing. And this is the last thing I want to show you, a needle holder. You see, this is, of course, extremely fine instrument, huh? very elegant, small ends, very important. We use uh, today most often a FIFO suture. It's a polyamide suture, uh, monofilament. It should not be too sticky for the patients, otherwise patients complain about these suges very much. And you see that uh, uh, when it's very fine flap uh, releasing incisions, then I often switch over to 6O. And when we do, uh, let's say, mobilization of the flap, and I want to make sure that this flap is not opening up, then I use a mattress suture, and then I use a 4O suture. Also 4O, 10%. 20%, 6-0, 10%, 20%, 5-0, 60-80%. Monofilament uh, and uh, polyamide. Uh, this is my favorite. Okay, I think I did not forget anything. Yes, something I've forgotten, perioprobe. 
Uh, you might be surprised. I'm a neurosurgeon. Uh, uh, I don't do a lot of periodontal diagnostics uh, because for that I have top, top periodontists uh, working with me or working in a team. But this is an instrument I love to use in implant surgery to orient myself. Huh? So a single tooth gap, I, the axis of the implant is most important. Then when we prepare the implant bed, I use this and go to the incisal edge. I know exactly my axis must be palatal to my line here. So this is used there. I can use it to compare where is the CEJ. So this is an instrument I really love. This can be exchanged, of course. And uh, yeah, that's all I can tell you. I hope it was not boring. And uh, if you really want to do good surgery, I tell you, you need good instruments. Thank you.